What's up, nerds? Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me as always. My name is Nate in the Wild. It's so good to see you here again. This is part two of my Holy Grail time-lapse tutorial. The first one, if you haven't watched yet, we went out into the field, we shot a Holy Grail time-lapse sequence. Now we are back home in the studio. We're gonna do some editing. Let's get into it. Before we get started, I should mention that I am going to be editing this in LR time-lapse. It's by far my favorite time-lapse editing software. I've been using it for about six years. There's a link to sign up for it in the description below. Click that, check it out. Um, there's a free version, and if you love it, you can pay for uh, a license for the professional version. It's incredible. Every time lapse you've ever seen me edit is with that program. I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, it integrates seamlessly with Adobe Lightroom, so if you're already comfortable editing in Lightroom, it's a no-brainer plug-and-play option. So before we open Lightroom, or LR time-lapse, the first thing you're gonna do is put all of the files from your time-lapse, take them off the card and put them onto an external hard drive uh, in their own dedicated folder. If you edit in Lightroom, you're probably used to just putting the card in your computer and letting Lightroom do the import, but that's actually not the first step in this instance. You'll see why once we get into it a little bit more. So I went ahead and I already did that. Uh, I've just got it here on my little external hard drive. You can see that they are all here in this folder, the uh, Ruth Lake time-lapse is what I named the folder. Super clever of me, I was at Ruth Lake and I shot a time-lapse. My creativity knows no end. So now that we've got all the files in the folder, it's time to start editing. But before we do that, I did wanna say thanks to the sponsor for today's video, Artlist. There is nothing that kicks a time-lapse into high gear more than the perfect soundtrack, and the perfect soundtrack always comes from Artlist. I've used a bunch of different stock music websites over the years, and Artlist is just truly the best I've found. Tens of thousands of songs to choose from, all cleared for use for everything from social media to professional client projects, and any project you make with Artlist assets is free and clear to use forever. I've had songs that I paid for on other platforms get flagged for copyright infringement on YouTube in the past, so this is a huge deal to me. It has never happened with Artlist, even once, even after hundreds of songs across dozens of professional projects. But my favorite part about Artlist is that it's not just stock music, it's a one-stop shop for content creation with a full array of sound effects, footage, templates, plugins, and even an AI voiceover tool, if you remember that past video. Nothing kicks a project into high gear faster than quality sound design, and having everything available in one platform is just a lifesaver for me. Artlist has several subscription options available, from small social creator packages starting at just $9.99 a month, to full-blown professional packages that still only cost $39.99 monthly. Click the link in the description below to sign up, because honestly, if you're not using Artlist for your music, sound effects, and more, you're missing out. All right, so back into LR time-lapse. I have everything in that standalone folder. Now that it's open, you can see that you can just navigate through the volumes on your drive. So I click on that, it opens the time-lapse. You'll see that it does a little processing here in the upper left corner. Um, this blue line is your exposure graph. Um, you can see all that jaggedness, that up and downiness is the exposure adjustments I was making. You can see it starts to get darker and then I get a little brighter by making an exposure adjustment. It gets darker again naturally, I brighten it up. It gets darker, I brighten it up all the way through. It gets really jagged down here. That's that period I was talking about in Nautical Twilight with the fast rapid adjustments. Uh, you can see I overshot one here. That looks crazy. Um, we can do a little bit of a preview play through this. So let's check it out. I'll make the screen a little bit bigger. You'll see a ton of flicker with my exposure adjustments, right? So it looks okay. I'm, I'm in the right ballpark there. The exposures are roughly staying in the middle, but it's pretty jagged. Cool news is that's exactly what this program is designed to adjust for. So the best part about LR time-lapse is that it's literally as easy as just left to right across this bar at the top. You can see there's some buttons here. Um, Two rows, you just go left to right, top to bottom. So we're gonna click keyframes, wizard, holy grail, save, etc. auto transition, and then we're done. You honestly barely need your brain to make this program work, it's beautiful, but let's go through it. So keyframes, wizard to start, it's going to suggest a certain number of keyframes. 12 is actually a lot, but let's just roll with the default for the purposes of, of making this simple. Next, I click holy grail wizard. Um, this is a holy grail time-lapse, so that's obviously what we want. 
Now you'll see an orange line comes up here that looks like the exact opposite of my exposure adjustments, which shocker it is. That's what the Holy Grail wizard is for. That's pretty much it. We click save. It's just writing XMP metadata sidecar files, which makes me sound so much smarter than I am when I say that out loud. It's basically just writing down its own little internal notes about exposure adjustments and changes that it needs to make. Once you have that saved, you'll see this little icon that looks like a green arrow pointing to Lightroom. It's exactly what you want. You click that and you drag it into Lightroom. There's your import dialog. Now here's an important thing to note on this part. The copy is DNG, copy, move, add, etc. We're just going to click add because we want to add it to the catalog. If you click copy or move, it's going to either duplicate the files or move them to a new folder. We don't want that. We already have a folder of standalone time-lapse images from that night out. So you're just adding them to your Lightroom catalog. So you click the import button. Uh, they will import into your catalog. It takes a couple seconds to a couple minutes, depending on how many photos, the resolution of your camera, and how much money you've given our Lord and Savior Steve Jobs for a computer. Um, I have given quite a bit of money to Apple, so this will be pretty quick for me. Once it is imported, we will start the edit process. So this is as easy as coming down to this bottom area. Uh, in the very low right corner, you'll see it says LRT full sequence in this little drop down menu, which to be honest, I feel like 99% of people don't even know that, that menu is there. I didn't before I started time lapses, but surprise, there it is. Click on LRT keyframes. That will pull up the keyframes we made. So let's go back to LR time lapse really quick. Each one of those keyframes is just a notation for the program that that's a point of interest across the exposure changes. So here's the cool thing. This time lapse is 637 images. I'm only going to edit those 12. That's it. The rest of it will automatically be handled by LR time lapse. So I click that LRT keyframes button. It brings up the 12 images we have to edit, and then that's it. So let's get started on those. Um, the first three look nearly identical. So I'm gonna just give this one a quick little edit. There's not a whole lot that needs to change here. I'm gonna turn up my screen brightness a little bit so I can see. So um, I'm not gonna walk through a standard Lightroom editing session here because that's its own standalone video. I've done several of those. If you'd like to watch how I edit landscapes or Astro, I have videos for those. So I'm gonna move kind of quick through this. Just a little bit of shadows, a little bit of highlights, add some contrast, definitely add some Vibrance and saturation. Uh, I'm gonna warm it up a little bit. It looks a little bit blue. If you'll remember when I was out in the field, I mentioned that I was gonna set my white balance to a point that was gonna be a little too blue for sunset and a little too warm for astro. So I'm gonna compensate for that. I'm gonna warm this up a little bit because this is golden hour and I want it to look like that. Let's see here. Okay, that looks pretty nice. I mean, the sun is still up. It can only be so jaw dropping, you know? So you take that first photo. I'm going to just looking at these next photos. I think the next four all look pretty similar. So I clicked on the first one and then shift click on the fourth one. So they're all selected. And this little script icon up here in the top, if you click on that and you click LR time-lapse sync keyframes, it's gonna copy those over. And now you look, that edit looks pretty good. This one looks pretty good. That one looks pretty good. Time saved, we're done. Four out of my 12. I'm a third of the way through my editing process already. It's crazy. I'm gonna go back and make some slight changes on these just to show the progression of sunlight. So like this end of the day, I'm gonna warm it up a little bit more. Moving through, we can continue to warm it up. So let's see, I just made a slight warmth adjustment to that. Let's sync it again so that they all warm up a little. Oh yeah, that's starting to look really nice. I think that looks pretty good right there. And then on this one, I want it to be like really like that. I love that late in the evening, like immediately post sunset when you get that kind of alp and glow color. So I'm gonna make that really purple. These next two are full on blue hour. So I'm gonna have to undo that a little bit. This is gonna seem a little bit crazy going from that blue hour to this blue hour. Um, but that's what LR time lapse is for. This lighting, is going to change 
It's gonna seem dramatic for us from one keyframe to the other, but LR time lapse's job is to gradually adjust and compensate across the spectrum. So there is one adjustment. I think that actually looks pretty nice. So I'm gonna just continue doing that. I'm just gonna sync and walk my way across. Look at that. Halfway through, starting to get some stars showing. This looks good. It doesn't look too blue. So just really quick when I hit reset, see it's a little underexposed and a little bit too blue. So that's one of the things we're trying to compensate for, but I think with my edit, this looks pretty nice. Oh yeah, okay. So then continue to sync the keyframes. So this one looks too dark, it looks underexposed. So I'm just gonna try and get it exposed to where I want it. All right, starting to look pretty good, y'all. We have really blue on the default white balance there, but that's what I was talking about. This is still blue hour, this is not night, so it's unsurprising. The raw edit on the next one you can see is out of blue hour. It's starting to actually be full on nighttime. Um, so let's sync that keyframe, and I have a feeling it's gonna look really warm now, because this blue hour, we warmed it up by about 2000 degrees Kelvin, and about 15 uh, on the magenta green slider there, on the tint slider. So this next one that's out of blue hour is gonna look way overcompensated, and that's fine. What we're gonna do is just basically uncompensate. We're gonna slide the tint back towards zero. I'm gonna put the temperature back a little bit bluer, and now we're starting to be into what I'd call full astro edits, and so I'm going to give it a little contrast. This foreground is starting to look a little bit darker, but I like that. You can see this is a 15 second exposure in ISO 2500, so it's almost full blown night at this point. Now, one of the things that's kind of fun in LR time lapse is that you can walk a radial filter across the sky. So we're gonna do that just for the purposes of me demonstrating it. So, I'm gonna put this radial filter on the core of the Milky Way. And I'm gonna do it the frame before the Milky Way is really visible so it doesn't like blink into existence. It just sort of slowly transitions. I'm gonna give it just like the tiniest little adjustment because I don't want it to start making changes to my scene before there's actually anything to change. So it's just there, it exists. Uh, from here on out, you have to use the sync keyframes for all of your changes. But okay, so for this one, I'm gonna go back in to that gradient. So you can see it's off now because the Milky Way is moving across the frame. So I'm gonna reposition it appropriately. And now I'm gonna give it some changes. So I'm gonna make the whites up and the blacks down, give that some real punch. I'm gonna give it a little clarity. Do I wanna do dehaze? No, that's too much. I think that still looks a little too purple. Okay, perfect. So that looks pretty good. Don't worry about making this perfect right now. You can go back and make some adjustments. I'm going to copy that to the next frame. And now we're in full on astro settings. So wow, that is outrageous. But uh, if I compensate it to about where I like the Milky Way to look, I think that looks pretty nice. So we're gonna darken that up a tad. Don't forget to move the radial gradient across or the radial filter across. I'm going to make it even punchier. And there's a little bit of noise down here, so I'm actually gonna add a bit of luminance. We're gonna denoise this whole thing later, but there you go. Okay, and then now all of these exposures are basically the same. So I'm gonna just sync keyframes to the end. I'm gonna go one at a time so that I can move that radial gradient as the Milky Way moves. And you can even rotate it a little bit because the Milky Way doesn't just move left to right. It actually kind of does like a windshield wiper motion. So you can even rotate it as it goes across. And 
There's the clouds moving in. That was the end of my shoot. <laughs> okay, and we are done. So from there, you can kind of watch these back through one at a time, just to see. Make sure none of them look weird, none of them stand out to you in like an alarming way. So if you watched part one, you'll remember that when I was in the field, I mentioned that we actually do want it to get darker to show that this is nighttime. Now that we're editing, that's still super important. You can see that this foreground is dark, the trees and the rocks and the lake do look underexposed, but I think that's appropriate because this is nighttime. We could brighten this all the way up to where everything looks super balanced like a daytime shot, but first of all, you end up with a lot of introduced noise into the shadows, and it also just doesn't look that realistic, right? So if we reset this, to look more like an actual nighttime. And we can brighten this up a little bit, right? Like we can lift the shadows a tad, we can lift the exposure a little bit here, but I wanna keep it looking real. I want this to look like we are in a nighttime scenario because we are. The stars are bright, but the foreground is dark. Even in the naked eye, you're never gonna see everything. So if you fully flatten this exposure out, it's just gonna look a little bit unrealistic. I want it to get darker as it turns into nighttime, and I want that Milky Way coming out to stun, and if your foreground is honestly overexposed, then it's going to look a little bit silly. So just a quick reminder, be gentle with your edits when it comes to the nighttime portion. Don't try and lift your exposure to the point where every single detail in the foreground is visible because it's not realistic and it's gonna look a little bit silly. Okay, they're all edited. The next step is to save those edits. So I hit Command A or Control A if you're on Windows, select all of the keyframe files. You're staying in the keyframe filter here. So just those 12 keyframes and then you go up to the top here, you click metadata, and then save metadata to files. It saves them. Now when you go back into LR time lapse, you can see the edits that you made right here, and it kind of lines up, right? Like right as it starts to get darker, I made brighter adjustments. Pretty straightforward. Click auto transition. It's gonna do some crazy calculations, draw a thousand lines on the screen, and that just means message received. It's gonna start thinking, Super hard, you can see now it says visual preview, so it automatically moved, we're onto the second line here, it automatically moved from auto transition to visual previews without me. And it's processing every single one, there were 637 photos, we only edited 12, so it's editing that 625 remaining photos for us now, calculating all that out and rendering previews. If you click into your bottom frame here, you can actually see the Adobe DNG converter actively processing each photo. It's kind of fun to watch them bounce around and, and everything. All right, once that's done, you get your first sneak peek at the time-lapse with your edits applied. This one's always kind of fun, so I make it full screen. Click the play button. Okay, quick pause. What kind of an amateur? gets in front of their camera while shooting a time lapse. A loser. Whatever, we can edit that out, it's not too hard. Anyhow, um, you can all make fun of me in the comments if you want. That's a pretty rookie move, so you came to the right place to learn. Okay, so let's watch this through. There I am again, ruining it. Oh yeah, yeah, that looks nice. Look at how smooth that exposure changes. It's beautiful, there's almost nothing there to worry about. A Little bit of a flicker there. That looks awesome. I love that, okay. There's just one button left pretty much and that's visual deflicker. So if you look at this pink line, you still see some bumps, right? There's some little ups and downs and some weird stuff going on there. That's just minor exposure changes. If you go through to like, where is it? you can see that there's definitely some like minor exposure changes. It's just kind of the way the world is. There's also a lightning storm. So maybe it literally is just actually some of those exposures are a little bit different. So we click the visual deflicker button. Now you can see this neon green line that it drew. 
and the pink line, which is our actual exposures, are outside of that in several places. Your visual deflicker line is exactly what it sounds like. It's just going to deflicker it. And if you adjust the intensity, you'll see, you know, at zero, it basically follows your current line. At like 10, it smooths out the big changes, but you still get to keep like, it gets a little brighter in the middle and a little darker at night. If you go around like 40, go really heavy on it, it's gonna make pretty much just a flat line across the screen. So that's a little much. I'm gonna go maybe to like 30. It's gonna deflicker it pretty good, but not super intense. Uh, you can do multi-pass deflicker. You will at some point in your life have a time lapse that is a huge pain in the butt and you're gonna have to run deflicker like seven times. That's where the multi-pass deflicker and clicking accuracy more is really helpful. For this, this looks really good already. So I'm just gonna put it to 30, single pass, leave it at default and click apply. It's going to do the same thing as before where it's gonna wipe that pink line and re-edit those visual previews based on how far out of the range of your deflicker parameters it is. Um, you can see my DNG converter is going freaking crazy right now processing those. Thanks Steve Jobs, you took all my money, but now my computer is quick. And uh, that should be done in just a couple seconds here. This is way faster than your original visual preview render. Boom, done. Okay, so look how much better that line looks. You can watch it through again, maybe go to this little problem area. I don't see anything there, so I don't really think it's worth rerunning it. That looks awesome. So now we come to the fun part, but also the very time consuming part. Unfortunately, not manual labor time consuming, but more like go make a sandwich and come back in a couple minutes kind of a thing. Um, so there's export and render internal or export and render Lightroom. We're going to not do it internally because this is a pretty big time lapse. So uh, we're back into Lightroom. I'm going to leave the LRT keyframes filter down here. So click on that, go back to full sequence. Now you can see that the keyframes are edited, but the rest aren't. And they have this little error message up top, which says the metadata has been changed, which duh. We just did that. So command A to select all of them, go back up to meta metadata and you click read metadata from files. And I want to just double reinforce this. The first time when you edit your keyframes, you save the metadata. After LR time lapse has rendered the previews, you read the metadata. If you click save metadata right now, it will wipe everything out and start you back at square one. It will overwrite all of that LR time lapse processing that we just did. So click read metadata from files. And it's going to basically take those visual previews that LR time lapse just calculated for us and apply them to your Lightroom photos as though you personally edited them. It's so beautiful it could make a grown man cry. I'm just so happy. Now we are ready to export. We're ready to render this son of a gun and get going. So you have to right click and go to folder and library. Why? Who knows? Nobody knows. I don't know. It's just a thing you have to do. I don't question the almighty Gunter Wegner who wrote LR time lapse. I just do exactly as he says and he makes me a very happy man. Command A again and then I hit Command Shift E to export. Uh, it says export time lapse up here. You might default to hard drive. If this is your first time using the program, that's fine. Just click up here, go to time lapse, and you have a bunch of export options. And it's sort of complicated. It sort of depends on what you're looking for. If you don't have LRT Pro, you can export as a JPEG in eight bits. I have the LRT Pro. I'm going to export it as a TIFF file in 16 bits. I didn't spend seven hours filming this time lapse and hike into the woods in the middle of the night to export JPEGs at 8 bit. Let's export it, original resolution, TIFF, 16 bits. I do think the LRT Pro is worth getting just for that. It's not that expensive. Honestly, it's worth it, especially if you want to do day to night time lapses. These are a huge commitment. Why would you want to, you know, go halfway at the very, very end, you know? Okay, then you just click export and away she goes. Another outrageous win for the ease of processing with LR time lapse is that the second the Lightroom export is finished, 
LR time lapse just automatically opens a dialog box for assembling those finished images into a video. Uh, it's extremely cool how well they communicate together. If once again, you are a Lightroom user, it's just a no brainer. This is gonna have a bunch of the same questions. What resolution, what quality, etc. Again, I put so much effort into this. I want it to look good. So I'm going to go ProRes in full 8K quality, very high, uh, export it at 24 frames per second. Uh, so I'm just gonna export it out onto the same hard drive uh, that the Lightroom exports are on and click render video and away she goes. So LR time-lapse just finished the export. It output this incredible ProRes time-lapse. Look at this beautiful thing. Honestly, all in all, I am super happy with how that came out. I think that is just gorgeous. There's one last step that I like to do to take a cool time lapse and make it a crazy good time lapse, and that involves putting it into Adobe Premiere or your favorite video editing program, and we're gonna just give it a little bit of motion. Um, this is gonna default to an 8K time lapse, which I don't need, so I'm gonna change my sequence settings to be standard 4K. It's gonna be punched in a little bit, but that's fine. Okay. This part's easy, but I'm gonna walk you through it anyways, because why not? So we have this time-lapse start to finish. It's going, it's pretty cool. I'm gonna add a little bit of motion to it. So I'm gonna click the um, keyframes button for the scale and the position. And we're gonna start it in, I don't know, like 135 maybe, then go to the very, very end and scale it back to the original position. So now you can see just as it plays, it's gonna zoom in and out a little bit. It's really subtle when you're watching it at regular speed, but it gives it just that tiny extra little bit. So check this out, we're also going to, we're gonna start a little bit down. So now as you watch, it's gonna pan up. Go back to the end. So that as we get towards the end, it's mostly sky. And so now we're not just zooming out, we're also panning up. We're giving it two axes of motion here. That really kicks it into high gear already. One more thing I like to do is do a little bit of speed ramping. So you have to make this bar bigger, drag it up you can plop a keyframe in. So personally, I like watching those shadows move up and the clouds change color. And then the blue hour, I just sort of feel like is a little bit slow. And so I click to make a keyframe. I'm gonna speed along until right when the Milky Way comes out and I'm gonna put another keyframe in there. I'm gonna bump this up to about 200% speed. So instead of a 25 second time lapse, it just takes like two or three seconds off you can soften up those transitions a little bit. And so now here's what that's gonna look like. Normal speed through the sunset, kicks a little into the time-lapse and then smooths out. And you can be as dramatic with this as you want. Like you can go up to 800% here it's gonna look a little bit aggressive, but you can do it if you wanna just like get to the meat of it, right? That's the kind of thing that doesn't look bad. That looks kind of cool, right? It's sort of like one of the first tricks you learn in the book of video editing is those speed ramps. It's a little bit overused by people on YouTube sometimes when they're trying to make highlight reels, but it is still a cool feature to be able to play with. I think you should soften up that transition if you're gonna go that hard with it. But let's be real, we're all here to see that Milky Way come out. So that transition just looks amazing when you do it like that. So some final adjustments to that speed, I think 800 is a little bit aggressive. And then one last thing that I do like to do, there's that tiny bit of flicker there at the end that I didn't get out in LR time lapse. You can go back through and rerun D-Flicker and get this fully solved, but there's a little bit of high ISO noise and I think that's where that flicker's coming from. So I have a video plugin called Neat Video Reduce Noise. 
that I like to use on this. And so I'm going to put it on this clip. I'm going to run, run the plugin to reduce the noise. So you can do a profile, an auto profile based on your image. You can just click generic profile. But the important thing for me is I like to enable the temporal filter, drag it all the way up, enable the D flicker, and that will get rid of the majority of that flicker issue. I click apply. So no matter how good your computer is, this is one of the most resource hungry plugins I've ever used in my life. So I don't think we're gonna be able to actually watch this back in real time, but I'm gonna export this and we're gonna be able to take a look at how it looks. There's no reason for you to sit here and watch me export this. So I'm just gonna say thank you for being here. That's about all I have for you today. Let's take a look at how this looks. But in the meantime, if you liked this, please click like, subscribe to the channel, or consider joining me in the field at one of my in-person workshops. I teach them all over the world from New Zealand to Norway to right here in the United States, focused on astro, landscapes, wildlife, and yes, time lapses. We can do this in person together. I would love to teach you how to do this. It's one of my favorite things in the world. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for being here. Let's check out this final video and see what we got.